So is it safe to assume that y'all are still pretty mad about what happened on Sunday and the current state of affairs as it surrounds your Carolina Panthers? Y'all still want Matt Rule out of town? Yeah, I figured so. Time is running out for you, old Matty boy, or you're going to have to get right out of town here in Carolina. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here over at the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to watch this show and subscribe to the show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel, drawing very close to 3,000 subscribers. So thank you so much to all of you who have subscribed to the show over on YouTube. And be sure to check us out wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, whether that be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or all the rest. Just be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of the show. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, over on Twitter, at Julian Council, because every single Friday here on the show, I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions. To participate in this week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag on Locked On Panthers, either at me or DM me on Twitter, at Julian Council. But of course, first, make sure to follow me on Twitter, at Julian Council. Today's episode of Locked On Panthers is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 of promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. My hope is that you, my listening audience, or my viewers are sitting here and are calm from what happened on Sunday afternoon as the Carolina Panthers lost their ninth straight game, losing 19-16 to on the road to the New York Giants. My hope is that you are now listening to this or watching this with a level head, and you feel a lot better than you felt Sunday afternoon around 4 o'clock when the Carolina Panthers lost that game to the Giants. I am not naive. I do know people are still mad as hell about the current state of affairs here in Carolina. And Matt Rule tried to make more sense of what's going on here with his team as he says that they're so close to being one of the competitive teams in the NFL and being a team that can be a playoff team and that can make you proud and a team that you won't be cursing every Sunday afternoon and the occasional Thursday evening. Matt Rule spoke to the media as he always does on Monday afternoon following the game and talked about how his team is pretty resilient. He points to his first season where the Panthers started off 0-2, losing to the Las Vegas Raiders with a questionable fullback dive on fourth and one that led to uh, nothing. Shocker. Don't give the ball to Alex Arma. And then in week two, losing on the road to Tampa Bay and losing Christian McCaffrey. And at that point in the year, people were saying, oh, season's over. Go ahead, pack it up. Don't bring back McCaffrey at all because we should go ahead and tank because this team's going to suck. Well, y'all weren't really wrong at all. The team was no good. McCaffrey ended up getting hurt again in Kansas City and another time trying to work his way back and didn't play very many games that season. And the Panthers were no good. And y'all, to this day, still hate Teddy Bridgewater, even though he was a lot better than the guy named Sam Darnold that played for this team a year ago. So Matt Rule points to that 0-2 start where they did bounce back and go 3-2. and And it was funny to me. During that season, there were people who were writing articles about, oh, man. Panthers off to a three and two start after going zero and two. A little bit surprising. Teddy Bridgewater looking pretty good. Could he be the guy for the future? And those same people come November and December were saying, "Oh, Teddy Bridgewater running out of time to prove he can be a franchise quarterback here in Carolina." And the following week, Teddy Bridgewater proves that he is not the guy long term here in Carolina. Duh, we always knew that from the beginning. But a fair point for Matt Rule to bring up that they started off 0-2, then bounced back to 3-2. and Didn't really matter from that point on as they ended up going 5-11 and in his first season where the expectations were very, very low for his team. Not the same here in 2022. As I've stated multiple times on this podcast, the thought was when Rule came here 
in January 2020, they were going to stink in 2020. In 2021, they needed to make some sort of improvement. You would like to see it a win-loss record, but we didn't see it. We at least saw it defensively, and they found a kicker who now is out for the season here in 2022. There were improvements, but not overall that you wanted to see from a second-year team, from a coach who certainly people such as myself question whether he could actually compete at this level considering the history of college coaches who have been better than rule that have failed at the NFL level. Year three was always set up for the Carolina Panthers to have their long-term quarterback figured out, which they don't, for the Carolina Panthers be prepared to take over the NFC South, which after two games, hard to believe the Carolina Panthers are in a position to turn this around and win the NFC South this upcoming season. The Panthers were not supposed to be in this position after two weeks, and certainly they weren't supposed to be in this position at all in plenty of areas of this organization heading into this year. That is the frustrating things that a lot of you and me as well, as well feel when evaluating where this organization is on September 20th or 19th. If you're watching this on YouTube on Monday night, it's not good. And Matt Rule saying how his team's resilient, I don't necessarily doubt that they have always played hard for them for him they have not quit on him that is one thing that you can say to to his credit with this team at least they're trying if they get trampled it's not for a lack of effort it's just they're not very good and they're not getting trampled in these games this season two teams that they probably should have beaten based off of on paper and I get New York was a favorite when you looked at it those are two games that the Carolina Panthers really needed to win to get off to a good start, to get the vibes to a place that has not been in a while, dating back to probably November of last year when Cam Newton came back, and to really just get off to the right start to where they can propel themselves to being a playoff team like I thought they would be entering this season. So I don't really feel all that encouraged by Matt Rule saying, oh, well, hey, my first year we started off 0-2 when the expectations were extremely low, but we won three straight games. Totally forget that we ended up 5-11, and 11, but we've shown in the past that we can start off 0-2, and, and we can come right back, and we can win some games, and then still do nothing in the end. Okay, great to hear, Matt. Now, one thing he did say on Sunday was that he wasn't really all that concerned about the receiver snaps, where DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson and Shai Smith are getting the vast majority of the snaps. They got all the receiver snaps week one, as they only played 53 snaps, and then... Yesterday on Sunday's game, they played 58. Still not nearly as many plays. I think maybe it's 50 or 50. it's something around there. It's whatever. It's something around that point um, where they're playing like in the 50s, which they need to play way more snaps than that offensively for the Carolina Panthers. Rule said he didn't really feel like they needed to give another guy a chance after Shy Smith dropped the ball twice. And that other guy was Rashard Higgins, who has yet to play here in Carolina. Looked impressive in the preseason and throughout training camp, has that natural rapport that he's built with Baker Mayfield and their time spent in Cleveland. And that's, I think, a big reason why he's here in Carolina. Well, I guess it's not a big reason because he was already here, but that's what made it even more, um, uh, made, made it made more sense for Baker to come here because, oh, he, has, he already has a receiver he can work with. He already has a, a relationship with. But yet we haven't seen Higgins at all. Terrace Marshall, I didn't even notice him out there on Sunday. Apparently, he played six snaps. Did you guys see him play six snaps? Because I certainly didn't see him play six snaps. Maybe I'm not playing. I guess I'm not paying close enough attention. It didn't look like he was out there. Didn't get a target in those six snaps. So, I don't know. But Matt Rule saying that he needs to get more guys involved. Marshall's only played six snaps in two games. Higgins, again, zero. And Chenault, LaVisca Chenault, who they traded for, still not up to speed, been inactive the last two weeks. We'll see how that pans out here going to the game against the Saints on Sunday afternoon. And one area he could help the team out with potentially could be kick return. As Chuba Hubbard, that man does not need to return another kick the rest of the season after what we saw on Sunday afternoon. And Matt Rule was asked about Chuba Hubbard and potentially finding a new kick returner and saying that Chuba understands he can't put the ball on the ground twice like he did yesterday. One of them on the opening kick set off the worst kind of start for the Carolina Panthers um, in that game. And basically from the opening kick, you knew they were going to lose that game. That, it's as simple as that. The Vikings game last year where Sam Darnold ran around for 10 seconds and threw a pick, you knew right then and there, this is going to be a terrible day. This team ain't going to win this game. Same feeling I had when Shuba Hubbard fumbled the opening snap or kickoff and in the next possession when Robbie Anderson gets stripped. Two turnovers to start the game. You're just not going to win in those situations. And it doesn't help, especially when the Carolina Panthers are the only team in the league through two weeks 
who have not forced a takeaway. And that was one of the points that Matt Rule brought up with this defense going from good to great. Offensively, still pretty bad. As I said, 28th in total offense through two weeks. Defense is in the top 10 and ninth in total defense so far, but still better in the red zone, not getting enough takeaways. Shuba Hubbard, don't expect him to return kicks anymore. LaVisca Chenault, if he is active on Sunday, quite possibly that's a place where he can return kicks for the Carolina Panthers. Quick injury update, Bravion Roy, had an MRI. Dante Jackson will be getting an MRI. He was speaking to the media on Monday. I think it was Steve Reed from the Associated Press who had talked to him. It sounds like Dante's going to be more day-to-day the rest of this week, and he expects that he'll play on Sunday against New Orleans. I imagine he'll probably be limited throughout the week, and the hope is come Friday when Matt Rule speaks to the media for one final time, he will say that Dante Jackson is good to go on Sunday. Maybe it'll be a game-time decision. I don't know, but Dante Jackson at least feels that his hamstring is going to be good enough by the end of the week to be able to play against New Orleans in a game the Carolina Panthers, quite frankly, must have or the shouts from you into the ether that are being ignored by your owner will get even louder and I will be even more annoyed by the state of affairs here in Carolina. It's not annoyed the fan base. I'm just annoyed that we can't all be happy because this is not fun at all. All right, so y'all want Matt Rule fired. I talked a little bit about this yesterday. What benefit do they really get from firing Matt Rule at this point in time? Let's lay out the pros and the cons of firing Matt Rule. And I'm sure you guys already know the pros. You get to be happy and you get ahead. We'll talk about that here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace of Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. Book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip. Get a classic or luxury car for a special event birthday, or holiday, find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from point A to point B, test drive that electric vehicle you've had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance, terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Ditch boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. I will say that this is probably the most bloodthirsty I've ever seen the Carolina Panthers fan base in my time of watching this team, which I guess I've watched all 27 seasons, plus these two games in a Panthers 28 season. Now, of course, there's plenty of games I missed when I was actually a kid, but whatever. I don't think I've ever seen the fan base. Like I talked about last week with Josh Klein of the Riot Report and the Roaring Riot. I don't think I've ever seen people this upset. I also don't think I've ever seen people this desperate for the head coach's head. We can go back to Ron Rivera when in his third season after a 6-10 and and 7-9 and campaign that the Carolina Panthers got off to an 0-2 start and he got off to a 1-3 and start and everyone wanted his head. Now he ended up going 12-4 and and winning the division that year and we know how everything panned out here for Ron going to the playoffs four or five seasons and being the best head coach we've ever had here in Carolina and someone who in a community we all loved, and he loved us back. Haven't seen that for Matt Rule. Pandemic doesn't help, but still, no. now the pandemic is over, according to the president. I guess I, I saw that news on Sunday night. This is not a political thing. Um, Matt Rule, really no excuses not to be out there. I guess he's not going to have much time to do it. It's pretty late at this point in time, but still, no excuses for him not to be out in the community engaging with the citizens of Charlotte or wherever he lives in the Charlotte metro area. Again, don't think I've ever seen y'all this desperate for the coach's head on the proverbial spike. And I'm not saying to actually do that because I'd be terrible, but if y'all really, I, I don't know. I'm just going to stop right there. Uh, either way, y'all, are, y'all want Matt Rule fired. I totally get it. And I'm not fighting it anymore. After two seasons, I was cool with him coming back because I just don't really feel like two years is enough for a coach to come in and figure things out, especially when you're flipping the roster. Well, the roster has been flipped. This is year three. This is the time to see the improvements. And you've seen the same sort of issues. And I talked about execution yesterday. I mean, it's the undisciplined nature of Matt Ioannidis on that defense, getting an offside penalty that gives the Giants a first down in a critical drive where they eventually get another first down in the game. 
It's Frankie Louvu who had a fantastic game yesterday aside from dropping a pick. It could have been a pick six. It's those kind of things where the players, they fell short, but also just like that falls on coaching at the end of the day. There's still the same issues offensively with the poor start defensively, just having to be on the field the whole time, not getting that stop when you really need it. The same things we've seen through the first two years of Matt Rule, we're seeing yet again. And the numbers I laid out on Monday, he's lost nine straight games. He's one in 25 in games where they allow 17 points or more. It's just 17 of the last 19 games. The Carolina Panthers have had the lead in those games. They're five and 12. He's now 10 and 25 overall. The numbers do not lay out that Matt Rule has done a good job here in Carolina, which you didn't need to see the name numbers to know that. You watch the games. I watch the games. I just wanted to give a coach another an opportunity to get, at least get three years, especially at the NFL level. If you can give him only two, then it's just like you're going to be recycling through coaches way too often. And maybe they should have got rid of Matt Rule. And if they would have, maybe they're in a better situation. We'll never know. But let's look at the pros and cons of firing Matt Rule today. The pro, we know the first one is it will make a lot of you happy that the coach is gone. Um, You'll have the renewed energy from the fan base like we saw Cam Newton last year when everyone was really down on the team and Darnold was bad and gets injured. And you're wondering, oh, great. Now we're going to have to rely on P.J. Walker the rest of the year. Of course, there was many of you who are out there yelling, oh, hey, bring back Cam Newton. All right, Cam came back. We saw the Arizona game. The entire vibe of the team just changed. The energy on that sideline of Cam there changed. They win that game. They come back. The home camming, Ron Rivera is back as well. Cam played excellent in that Washington game. They lose that game. They lose the next six games as well. And it was a fun 10 days, and that was it. So we've seen how renewed energy works with the fan base. You get those great – you get the high at the beginning, but when things end up to still be the same – the high is still not there anymore. So there will be a renewed energy, and y'all will finally get your wish. Uh, there will also be a new voice for the players. Maybe they need someone else in there to lead them. Uh, there's candidates, certainly, on this ro- on this coaching staff that could be that. Chris Tabor is not that far removed from being an interim up in Chicago. Uh, you also have someone like Ben McAdoo, who was a very bad coach with the New York Giants, who has head coaching experience. Maybe he's learned from that. His offense is terrible so far, so I don't really think he should be the top choice. There's Steve Wilkes the native son who's come home. He's on a one-year contract. He has been a head coach in this league before, got a raw deal in Arizona. Maybe he's someone who could be a candidate. We'll see. Certainly, if he gets 15, and I don't, doesn't look like he's going to get 15 games, but if he gets 15 games to be the head coach, that will give him an opportunity to show that he is the right man. There's also the opportunity to get an early start in the hiring process. It's very early. It's not like college where I guess they already have. I mean, I don't know. David Tepper certainly has to have a list of names that he would like to see. Typically, throughout the season, as things go on, you look at what offense is looking really good, what coaching tree this this coach might come from. It's really been the Shanahan tree and looking at guys who know Sean McVay and who know Kyle Shanahan. And if they their offense can be replicated in these other places, look at Minnesota getting Kevin O'Connell from LA. I mean, look at what happened in Cincinnati a couple years when uh, Zach Taylor had lunch one time with Sean McVay. He took him to the Super Bowl. Now they're 0-2 and they're back to being the Cincinnati Bengals. Who could have seen that one coming? Uh, Either way, it gives him an early start. And David Tepper said when he fired Ron Rivera on the off day with four weeks left in a season three years ago, that he didn't never want to put this team at a competitive disadvantage. Now he's already done that by hiring Matt Rule and just being himself. But either way, um, that's maybe a thought in David Tepper's eyes that if he gets the hiring process started now, that that puts him at a competitive advantage. I still believe, though, that coaches are going to wait and see what jobs are available and whether they really want to go to Carolina. And especially after a coach gets fired after two weeks into the season, we'll see. And there's a possibility that I could turn a season around that with a new voice, with the renewed energy from the fan base and the focus not being on whether the coach is going to have the anvil fall on his head or not week week to week, that the players might just be more focused and they can move forward and the energy can be good and this team can win. So those are the pros of getting rid of Matt Rule. The cons, well, this isn't college. There isn't a signing day that the Panthers are needing to uh, worry about in December. Like in college, all it's in vogue, as you've seen, Nebraska's fired Scott Frost. Herm Edwards got axed at Arizona State this past weekend. They do that early now so that they can get ahead of the hiring process because 
there is recruiting. The Panthers aren't recruiting players at, at, at right now during the season. Like they can't do that. That would be tampering. They're not going to start bringing players in until March. So there really is not a rush to bring in a head coach. So, I mean, I guess not necessarily a con. It's just a reality. I don't really see what much benefit it does for them because it's not like they're trying to get someone in before December 1st. Uh, it could also leave a bad perception around the league uh, for the Carolina Panthers. But we know that David Tepper is, a, is an aggressive owner. We know that David Tepper spent a lot of money on a head coach. And David Tepper has kind of gone silent. And he showed up and said he believes in Matt Rule. How much do we really believe that? I don't know. He's at least shown it by allowing Matt Rule to come back for another year. But if he gets rid of him after two years or two weeks, how much did he really believe in Matt Rule? And if coaches see that out there, and their agents certainly are going to be having conversations as well with the Panthers organization, and if we start seeing the reports that like, oh, hey, Panthers is not a very desirable job because there's questions about ownership and how the owner might be a little bit too emotional, a little bit too involved, which we've certainly seen. And I know as I'm a head coach, I work for that man. I totally get it. You should let him know, hey, this is what we're going to kind of do. This is what the situation is. But David Tepper does not need to be, in my opinion, in the war room during draft. He doesn't need to be in these conversations as far as what they're going to do as far as players they want to sign. Like, there's a big trade, a big signing. Certainly, you got to pass it by with the owner. But really, I think like the owner should just get out of the way, let the people he hired do their job. Are people going to want to work under David Tepper, seeing how he is an active participant in all of that? I just wonder, after two weeks, if they fire Matt Rule, how does that help the Carolina Panthers you know, perception-wise across the league. Also, David Tepper has to hire another coach. We've already seen how his first coaching hire went. Not going very well. Maybe it turns around. Unlikely that's going to be the case. Do you really want this guy to hire someone else? And I know you're saying right now, well, Scott Fitter could do it. You really think David Tepper is going to let Scott Fitter be the only guy in those interviews who actually handles the coaching hire? You really think Scott Fitter is going to handle the hire? My hope is that Scott Fitter will handle the hire. We've seen way too much so far from David Tepper to believe that he is not going to be an active participant in deciding who the next head coach here in Carolina is. My hope would be that David Tepper would step out, would maybe sit in the interviews but not say anything, and have Scott Fitter conduct it. And Scott goes to Dave and tells him, like, hey, these are the guys I want. How much you want to pay them? And then let the agents handle it. That's what I want to happen. That's not what's going to happen. David Tepper is going to be fully involved in who they decide to hire at the end of the day because it's the team that he owns, and that's just his nature. I also don't see how firing Matt Rule is going to fix the obvious roster holes. How is it going to fix the fact that they don't have someone opposite of Brian Burns who's going to rush the passer? How is it going to fix the fact that this defense, when they go up against an offensive line like the Browns and a team that is dedicated to run the football, how they're going to stop the run? I don't see how it's going to fix the fact that the Carolina Panthers don't have a kick returner right now who can't fumble the football. I don't know how it is going to fix a lot of the execution issues as you saw on Sunday. How is it going to help Shai Smith catch the ball? How is it going to help Ian Thomas catch the ball? How is it going to help Matt Ioannidis not go offside? How is it going to help uh, Frankie Louvu not drop an interception? I don't see how a lot of those obvious things that are out there and execution problems are going to be fixed because the head coach gets fired. A lot of it's on the players to go out there to do their job. Matt Rule said he's got to get him over the hump. Certainly, he has not done a good enough job to do that. And all this at the end of the day falls on him. I just don't know how it's Matt Rule's fault that Frankie Louvu dropped the pick six on Sunday. Because if he gets that, completely different outcome from that game Sunday afternoon. And we're probably not having this. We're definitely not having this conversation. And there's no guarantee if they fire Matt Rule that anything's going to change. Like of Cam Newton. It was fun. They brought back him. We saw the energy jolt there in that Cardinals game. We saw how he played against Washington and how the fan base was acting. They still lost that game, and they lost the six games after that. With Cam as a starter, then back to Sam, it didn't change anything. The Panthers still were just not a good enough team under Matt Rule that, that season. And I think the Panthers roster is good enough to compete. But there's no guarantee that that's the case because as, as good as I think a lot of these guys are, they still have not learned how to win in this league. And until they learn how to win, it's hard to believe that any of this can get turned around. So firing Matt Rule might make you feel good today. It might get you more reinvested for the rest of the season. But I'm pretty sure if you're out on the team now and, and Rule gets fired and they keep losing, you're probably going to be out on the team the rest of the way. Because that's just the way these things work. So maybe they fire him. I still have a hard time seeing that. For Matt Rule, it probably would be good. The sooner the better, because there are these college jobs that are opening, and I'm sure 
that these schools would love to talk to him. They're going to reach out to his agent anyway. I think his agent's Trace Armstrong. They're going to be reaching out to his agent on the back channels either way. But I'm sure, like he said last year, hey, I could have left and got one of these college jobs. He didn't do it. Probably should have done that, especially if USC or Oklahoma wanted them. Those are two jobs that don't come open very often. And those are two of the biggest jobs. At least Oklahoma doesn't come, come open very often. USC, it has. Lincoln Riley, we'll see how long he's there. It should be a while as long as he never wants to leave college and go to the NFL and, and lose like the rest of these guys who try to do it. Um, but we'll see how it pans out. I just don't really see much benefit of doing it. I get your frustration. There's 15 weeks left in the season. Matt Rule still has time. But as I said at the top of the show, he is running out of time. And he has pretty much lost at least all the fan base I see via social media. So the big question is, can the Panthers bounce back? We're sitting here. I, I think a lot of you are just, hey, I saw someone tweet out. I don't even care if they win a Super Bowl. I still want Matt Rule fired. It's absurd, but that's something that people are saying. And fans can be absurd a lot of times. And the passion is also the great thing about fandom, but also sometimes the worst thing about fandom. Can they bounce back? I don't know. The numbers, they say no. And the history, it says no. But I felt like this was a playoff team for a reason. We'll get into that here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. Playing fantasy sports isn't just for Sunday. You can play it all the time over at Price Picks. So how does Price Picks work? You pick two to five players, and if they go score more or less than their Price Picks projection, you can win up to ten times your money on any entry. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Price Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That includes the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NHL, PGA Tour, college football, men's and women's college basketball, soccer. Uh, esports, NASCAR, tennis, boxing, you get the whole gist, every single sport, even cricket and more entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy, safe and fast withdrawals currently operational in over 30 states and north of the border in Canada. Download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% inch deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. So, this is how it works. If you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, prize picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an inch deposit match up to $100 when you download the price picks app or go to pricepicks.com. So, can the Carolina Panthers turn this season around? They lost to the Cleveland Browns with a quarterback in Jacoby Brissett who was not very good, but the Browns ran it for 217 yards on the Panthers, got the lone takeaway of the day, and then hit a 58-yard field goal. We saw on Sunday against the Giants, the Giants' offense wasn't very good. The Panthers held Saquon Barkley in that unit in check all day, were really good until they finally needed to stop, and unfortunately, a penalty from Matt Ioannidis and the inability to take down Daniel Jones, and they lost that game, but the offense has not helped them through the first two games of the season, and they would definitely need to get better if the Carolina Panthers are going to find a way to get out of this 0-2 hole. Now, we all know the numbers. We've heard them all in the past. Over the last three seasons in the NFL, 27 teams have started their seasons 0-2, an average of nine per season. All 27 of those teams missed the playoffs. 538.com currently is giving the Carolina Panthers a 9% chance to make the playoffs. Since the NFL expanded its playoff format in 1990, only 30 of the 265 teams, that's 11.3% that started 0-2, made the postseason. And since the playoffs expanded again in 2020, none of the 18 teams that lost their first two games have qualified for the postseason. So that lets you know that the Panthers probably not in a good situation. If you even look at the franchise's history, here are the records of playoff teams for the Carolina Panthers after their first two weeks of the season. Back in 96, they started off 2-0 and and made the playoffs, of course, went to the NFC title game in 2003, started off 2-0, and of course, went to the Super Bowl and lost. In 2005, they started off 1-1 one and one and made the playoffs. 2008, they started off 2-0. 2013, they started off 0-2 and 1-3 and and to start the season. 2014, they started off 2-0 and made the playoffs. 2015, started off 2-0, as we know, went 14-0, 15-1 in that regular season and lost in the Super Bowl. In 2017, the last time the Carolina Panthers made the playoffs, they started off 2-0. So aside from 0-5 in 2013, the Carolina Panthers in every season they've made the postseason have started off the regular season at 
2005 is the only time they've ever gone one and one. And that's the year where they lost in the NFC title game to Seattle. I think that, yeah, that's to Seattle. And in 2000 and in 2013 is the only time in franchise history, the Carolina Panthers have started off. zero and two making them one of those 30 teams that have started off. zero and two invade the postseason since the NFL expanded its playoff format. So in order for Matt rule to keep his job, he's going to have to do something that's only happened one time in the organization's history in the 27 seasons prior. The odds are not in his favor. Like the numbers spell out that he has been a bad coach in Carolina, those numbers spell out that he's probably screwed and is not going to make the playoffs, and that's the case. He won't be back here in Carolina next season because I cannot imagine David Tepper is going to sign himself up for another season of Matt Rule football here in Charlotte. It is possible, though. And here's the thing about me, too, like, I totally understand the frustration out there, especially for the folks that wanted Matt Rule gone. I totally get it. You you felt like, hey, this was always going to happen anyways. This is why I wanted Matt Rule fired. Like, why is he here? I totally get where y'all are coming from. And maybe I'm in the wrong for wanting him back. We'll see how it plays out. I'm certainly willing to say I was wrong about things. I've already kind of told y'all, like on yesterday's show, it feels pretty clear that things are going to end in the way that a lot of you want him. And that's Matt Rule getting fired. Now, for me... I want the team to win, and I know you want the team to win. I'm trying to focus my attention on how they can get this thing turned around. First and foremost, the offense has got to be a lot better. 28th in the league is not going to work out. There can't be these no-shows in the first half. Baker Mayfield should have gotten way more time in this offense, dating back to OTAs and mandatory minicamps. Scott Fitter, Matt Rule, David Tepper, whoever, they needed to figure that thing out and get Baker in here at a timely manner so that he could have taken over the job and been able to get and understanding of Ben McAdoo's system. And the whole quarterback situation that they have with him and Sam Darnold, I get why they did it. I don't agree with it, but I understand why Matt Rule did that and in a way had to do that because the guys in that locker room that wanted to see Sam get an opportunity, those guys also have to understand the best chance for them to win this year was a Baker Mayfield getting all those snaps with the first team from day one down there in Spartanburg on the campus of Wofford College. It's going to be a work in progress on offense. They've had two weeks. They need to be ready to go come Sunday afternoon against New Orleans. No more excuses. Get out there, be prepared, catch the football, block your man, sit in the pocket and trust your offensive line, Baker, and deliver the ball accurately and move the football down the field. No more. They need to be much better on offense, and they have all the capabilities in the world to do it. They have way too many receivers out there that can make plays for only three guys to be getting opportunities. There's no reason why Stephon Sullivan and Gio Ritchie have a catch, and that Rashard Higgins is not getting a single snap, and Terrace Marshall is not getting an opportunity at all, especially when Shy Smith's out there dropping balls. Shy are in that position, but he can quickly lose it if he is not going to execute on Sundays at Sunday afternoon. That is something that needs to be focused upon moving forward here in Carolina. They're going to turn things around defensively. Keep doing what you're doing. But when someone wants to run the football, buck up and don't let them do it to you. The Giants offensive line ain't very good. Browns have one of the better offensive lines in the league. When you play a team like that again, moving forward, you cannot let them run the ball down your throat. Defense also needs to get takeaways. The Panthers are not putting themselves in a good enough position defensively to set their offense up to have success. Now, the offense, time and time again, has not played complimentary football and has put the defense behind the eight ball, leave them out there week in and week out for the majority of the game and losing the time of the possession battle every single week. I totally get that. But defensively, they have to find a way to get turnovers and put the offense in a situation where they can score in plus territory starting off a drive. We did not see that yesterday or on Sunday when Frankie Lupo had the opportunity to get that pick, whether he gets a pick six or not. That should have been points to the Carolina Panthers. When he drops that, he takes three, potentially seven points off the board. That's three points that they absolutely needed that could have tied the game, and at seven points, that could have won the game for the Carolina Panthers on Sunday. Again, not only blaming the defense, of course, not really blaming them at all, just pointing out things where they have to improve. I thought this team would be a playoff team because I expected Baker Mayfield to be a better quarterback than Sam Darnold, which I think he's going to be. Has he been great so far this year? No, Sam certainly got off to a better start. I understand that. There's still plenty of time for Baker to figure things out. McCaffrey showed what he can do again on Sunday when they give him the football when he broke out that 49-yard run. Christian's going to be good this season. You got to get DJ Moore the ball and get him involved. Robbie, the fumble aside, off to okay start so far, especially week one was really good. 
get these other guys involved. The tight ends actually have done some things. Just can't drop the ball on critical downs in the red zone. Ian Thomas, offensive line, they've given up a couple sacks so far this season. Icky, it's going to be a learning process. Please be patient with him. That is a unit, as we've already seen, is better than where they were a year ago. And defensively, that's still a unit that can be really good. Frankie Louvu looks like he's ready to go. Shaq had a good game. Brian Burns has been excellent through the first few games of the season. I don't get why they're dropping him back in coverage so much. Get that man out there after the quarterback, especially when he had two sacks in that game. Do not drop him back in coverage. You're just wasting his snaps out there. And I understand you want to give different looks, but certainly in those obvious passing downs, go find someone else to go out there and cover somebody. Don't have Brian Burns doing that. Get that man out there playing. Meet me at the quarterback over whatever Phil Snow thinks makes more sense with him dropping back in coverage. This still can be a team that can make the playoffs. The one thing I hate is when people get so excited about football, then after two weeks, give up. I get it. You don't like Matt Rule. But the fact that you sit here and you beg for football, you you want football back, and you quit after two games, when in the NFL you can lose eight or nine games and still make the playoffs, we benefited from it here in Carolina where the team was no good. Well, they're three, eight, and one, and then they won the rest of the games, end up seven, eight, and one, and won a division. I don't think the division is going to be bad enough for them to be able to do that again this upcoming this season. But we've seen in the past, like you can lose games. This isn't like college football where there's only four teams that make the playoffs. If you lose one game, you're screwed. Like you're, the season didn't end after two weeks. And we've done this in the past before in 19. We got upset after two games. Hey, season's over. They won four straight games. Of course, they ended up not winning the, going to the playoffs because Kyle Allen's a bum. And in 2020, same case, the expectations were never playoffs that year, but they can turn it around. This is a roster in a much better place. I'm not sitting here ready to quit at all because, hey, I want to be able to talk about a winning football team. I don't want to sit here and have to talk about who could be the replacement for Matt Rule, why the coach is so terrible. I don't want to be spelling out all these bad numbers week in, week out on this show. That does not make it fun. There's a reason why I thought they'd be a playoff team. I'm still going to cling to that because who knows? Last season, they got the 3-0. People were talking about playoffs. And what happened? 5-12. and 12. This season, they're 0-2. People are talking about firing the coach. Who knows? Maybe it's the inverse. Maybe they go 0-3, then they turn around, go 12-5. and 5. We'll see. But let the season play out just a little bit longer before jumping off shit. Please, do what you got to do. If, you, if, they, if it's best for you to just not watch it and for your mental health and for you not to be throwing stuff, breaking things in your house, then do that. I just don't think it's time to give up on this team just quite yet. The head coach. It might be too far gone, man. I don't know. I just am trying to hold out that hope that what I saw on this team from what the moves Scott Fitterer made and what I know these guys are capable of doing, I'm just hoping that we can finally see that play out. The problem is hope and wishing and that just, it can kill you sometimes, man. I know the hope's killing a lot of people here in Carolina. And for me, it's, damn, it's frustrating. But I'm hoping that's going to be the case. And, you know, there's someone who, can give us some really good perspective on an 0-2 start and a coach on the hot seat and a team turning around and winning 12 games in a season. That person is Jonathan Stewart. Jay Stu, you know him, part of Smash and Dash. He will be on Locked on Panthers tomorrow. Big-time guest here on the show, Jonathan Stewart. Going to talk to him about his thoughts on this team because he, like me, was someone who was bullish and excited about the Carolina Panthers saying that they could shock the world in 2022 so far they have not done that but we'll see where Jonathan Stewart is with Matt Rule with this team what they can do to turn things around if he still believes they can shock the world and win back this fan base here in 2022 so check that out on tomorrow's show on Locked on Panthers but that's going to wrap up this episode again guys make sure to watch the show subscribe to the show over on Locked on Panthers YouTube channel check us out wherever you listen to your podcast rate review subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Julian Council because on Friday, I'm going to answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions either at me or DM me at Julian Council on Twitter to participate in this week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag. But in the meantime, stay safe, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Wednesday with Jonathan Stewart.